Well, let's, uh, let's just thank God and I'm going to turn loose. Y'all ready? Here we go. Lord, Wednesday, middle of the week, um, an opportunity to bow our head and our heart, and let our thoughts be pointed towards you. Lord, tonight, we've been, we've been talking about the God of the resurrection for a long time on Wednesday night, Lord, Not pretty much most of this time on COVID, really. And uh, since at least we've been back together on Wednesday nights, and I am grateful that you're the God of life. And Lord, because of sin, there is death. You didn't design it that way, and you won't let it end that way. And Lord, I, I'm grateful that uh, because of you, Jesus, I don't have to fear the second death. Lord, uh, one death will be enough, but to be absent from the body, to die to this world, and to be alive to you forevermore. And I love that word, forevermore. So, Father, we're going to study a little bit more about it. You gave it to us in your word. You pointed us to our future. And, Lord, we want to be aware of that. But, Lord, we're living in today. So I pray that we will not just be thinking about what's going to happen, but, Lord, that it would change our todays so we can live well for you as we look forward to what's going to happen. So, Father, just bless our time. I pray, Lord, that I will not try to say too much but Holy Spirit, that I will say the words that you bring it, bring it in front of my eyes and that we can go from there. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. One of my difficulties as a preacher, uh, my lacking in a preacher, is sometimes I have more uh, content than I have time. And I want to say too much. And I apologize, two weeks ago, um, I tried to say too much. But to do future timing in I took 35 minutes. It's just impossible almost. And I had, so I, I took you, and I knew when I did. When I took you to Daniel and tried to tie it to Revelation with the 70 weeks, I just knew that that was going to be hard. Now, I'm going to probably do the same thing tonight, but I'm going to apologize ahead of time, and I'm going to tell you up front that I'm going to do my best to try to dumb it down for Brian's sake. Amen? Because if my mind goes faster than my tongue, then it won't make sense to anybody. So we're talking tonight about the second coming. And for us to really, we need to pick up um, at the time of the tribulation and real quickly go through the time of the tribulation so we can talk about the second time coming of Christ. And then we're going to um, talk about what it will be like during the millennium. Is that fair? And I'm picking up with the tribulation because I didn't get through there last time. So we're going to look, once again, we're going to let the Word of God speak. So if you've got your copy of God's Word, keep it in front of you. Start in Matthew 24. We're going to look at our, what our Lord had to say about this. This was getting very close to the cross. And he wanted to, uh, because of uh, the need of understanding, to uh, make sure that this group of 12 would, would understand and know so that they could share and they could grow. Because this was going to be a, a huge question. When we look at the early church and we look at the teachings of Paul and others, uh, some of the time he said, these things I'm sharing with you, which I've already told you once, but he was having to share them again because you, you, can, really, you, you can really go deep in understanding. Now, the Old, Old Testament speaks about the second coming of Christ continuously. One of my favorite books in the Old Testament is the book of Isaiah. And in those 66 chapters, it's just covered up with prophecy about the coming of Christ and what it will be like in his millennial reign. But here we're just going, in, in a, Jesus could say more with less words. So we, let's just look at what he says in Matthew 24, and let's begin reading in verse number 4. Jesus answered and said to them, take heed, watch out, be aware. Really, he is saying, know these things so that your actions can, be, uh, can, can act accordingly. Take heed that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, that is God's name, Christ's name, and say, I am the Christ, and they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. I like that. There's going to be difficulty. There's going to be hardship. There will be wars. There will be, people will always be talking about, is this going to be war? Is this going to be war? This thing's about to happen. This thing's about to happen. But he tells us up front, don't be troubled. 
Now, the only way that you cannot be troubled is not fearful of something that's coming. We've got something that will take away our fear, something that's bigger than the, the obstacle that we think is coming. And when we see war, if we were looking tonight and we were saying war in America, we would be fearful for Jacob and our young people who would go to war. And we would be uh, prayerful. And we, we would wonder, you know, how we, as a country, we're still a very, very young country. But it's been a long time since we've had a battle on our soil. We fought battles at other places. But, you know, if one was coming here, we would probably have a, a real all-night prayer meeting. Amen? But he says, you're going to hear of wars. There will always be rumors of war. There will always be things that will trouble you. But he says, you don't be troubled because of it. All these things must come to pass. All these things I'm going to allow. This is not my will, but this is not my perfect will, but it's my permissive will. It's something that I'm going to allow to happen. So he says, uh, uh, these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. God's got the end. Have you ever heard anybody say, I've read the end of the book and I know who wins? So as long as we know that God's got this, and he does, as long as we know that he's in control, and he is. And as long as we know that in the end, it's going to be beyond anything we could ever comprehend good, then we can go through it. You know, there's, there's times that we'll go to the doctor and we, we might not like the, what they will say or we might not like a treatment that they make us want to go through, but we'll go through it because it's the good and right and best thing, right? Understand, we may not like all the things that are happening, but God is still on the throne. As long as he's on the throne, we don't need to be worried or fretting about any of those things. Make sure the first sign that you see, that's why he says take heed. Make sure that the first sign that you have of troubling spirit, you take it to the Lord. Because God doesn't want you to spend one moment of one day with a troubled spirit. As long as he's God and he's on the throne. That's why he's telling us these things are beforehand. Verse 7, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And I think this is very interesting. Look at the end of verse 7. There will be famines, pestilence. Pestilence, the root word is the word we would think of as pest, but it is also described as plague or disease. This word would be extremely familiar to be translated disease. There will be famines. And in our world today, there are still famines. With all the new processing and how we uh, grow foods, there are still famines in the world. Disease. There's always been disease. There's always going to be disease. And right now, we're going through something as if it is new when it's really not. I mean, even COVID has been around for a long time. This is just COVID-19. If you look at Lysol, it'll say on it kills COVID, right? This is just the latest branch of it. Nothing new. So he says, don't be troubled by it. There will be famines. There will be diseases, earthquakes in various places. There will be natural disasters. Now, I don't know how you can call a disaster natural. But if you see them enough, you know, after Katrina, when we went down, we were there about two weeks after Katrina hit, and, and we were really on the coast in, in, in uh, Mississippi. It hit right there between Mississippi and Louisiana, but the, the, the strongest part of the storm was on the east side of it, and we were there in Ocean Springs, and I look up and I see a boat about 25 foot up in a tree. Literally, I mean, we're right there on the coast, the little road that's right there by the, by the beach, and I see a boat that high up, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, right? We met a lady who was there who literally got on blocks on her front porch and tied herself to the pole, kind of a ranch-style house, uh, tied herself to it, standing up on a block, and she said the water got up to her neck because she didn't want the water when it came back out to take her out. There will always be disasters, fires in California. It's hot in California now. Amen. There's always going to be earthquakes. We ha we've had them in North Georgia, believe it or not. 
I woke up with one somewhere in the early 2000s, and uh, it shook. It, I mean, it woke me up shaking the, the house up here in Clarksville, Georgia. And I'm like, wow, th there are these things that are going to be there. They're always going to be there. He says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Here's the key. This is going to be happening. This is just uh, the birth pains. They start slow, but then they increase in frequency and in um, how hard they are. Verse 9, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness, lawlessness will abound, this is a huge, look at verse 12. The love of many, not a few, he says, but many, their, their love will grow cold. That's frightful. That there will be people who know God, who love God, but because of hardship, instead of growing closer to God, their heart will grow, I don't want to use the word indifferent, but there's a difference between when your heart is hot for God, you can't get enough, you're hungry, you want more. You, you, you eat a meal of God's word, but it doesn't satisfy, so you have to come back and get more. You come to God's word, you hear preaching, and you want more. You have times in prayer, but it doesn't satisfy completely. You go back to God, and you want more. You, you carry your burdens to the Lord, and you feel peace, but yet there are more burdens, and you go to that peace that goes beyond understanding more and more. He says, because lawlessness will abound. Because people in their walk with God will become ungodly. They will become worldly. Many will grow cold. That should be an alarm to us. That those of us who know the most, who should be the most on fire, may it never be said of us that we've allowed our walk with God to grow indifferent. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations, and then, in the, and then the end will come. Then he, in this time of tribulation, he moves to the second half of the tribulation. And in the second half of the tribulation, let me, let me give you the, the real quick, and I can tell you right now, I'm not going to get to the millennium. I'm looking up at the clock. During the first three and a half years, Remember, the, the rapture happens, and that begins the tribulation. The Christians are taken out. We meet the Lord. He doesn't come to the earth, but we meet the Lord in the air, and we go back to heaven for, that first, for this time of the tribulation. Now, then this anti-Christ, the false Christ, he is Satan's Christ. He will begin to, he will come forward and he will try to bring people together to him. He, is, he has his own um, propaganda master called the false prophet. And, and he will be preaching the story of, of world peace through the Antichrist. And he will, he will be performing miracles so that people will say, he has the power to bring peace. And in the world, he will go to Israel and he'll sign a pact with Israel now, listen to me now. Don't miss this. The Antichrist. Now, I know Scripture says don't, don't ever side against Israel, that those who bless Israel will be blessed and those who curse Israel will be cursed. But understand that this Antichrist is a deceiver, and he will go to Israel and he'll make a pact with them that they can rebuild the temple. And he will put all of his funding behind it. He'll unite the world in peace, promising peace. And they will rebuild the temple. Now, in the process of that, all those Arab nations, Muslim nations around it, we say that because in Ezekiel 38, it describes all of those nations around it. You would say uh, uh, North Africa. You would say the, the, what we would call the Middle East. But it will be led by the country of the north that could not be anything other than Russia. Simply looking at Old Testament scripture and the land uh, that was called by that particular term 
uh, Kush and Put, those terms are what we would know today as modern-day Russia. They don't like the Antichrist. They don't like this, this um, um, pact that he's made with Israel. Understand that as we look at it today, Russia to now is the major seller of arms in the Middle East. Understand that. So he is saying to them, he said, we'll go and we'll attack Israel. Antichrist will come again against them. And listen, the Antichrist will win that battle against that army of the north and those that are around it. At that particular point in time, nobody will want to fight against him anymore. But then halfway through the tribulation, this is what happens. Verse 15, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, Spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. That's what we talked about last week or two weeks ago in Daniel chapter number nine. That is the Antichrist going to the temple where sacrificial system has been set up again. And he will pollute the sacrifice system and he will set himself up on God's throne. The throne that was designed for him and he will be worshipped as God in the world at that time. During this time of the tribulation, there will be one world political system. Everyone will go to the Antichrist. There will be one world economic system controlled by the government of the Antichrist. And there will be a one world official religious system. Now, everyone still, you've got to make that decision personally in your heart. Just because the government says this is the only thing you can worship. That doesn't mean that that's the way it rolls. It's still one heart at a time. And during this time of the tribulation, many will be saved. But others, because of the pressure that's placed upon them, they'll take the mark of the beast so that they can buy and sell. They will... They will pledge, I don't know the devotion, but they will pledge their, their allegiance, can I say it in that way, to the Antichrist. Now that's what moves from the first three and a half years to the second three and a half years. And that, at that time, when, when Satan's Christ sets himself up as the Antichrist, understand, it's going to get bad for the Jewish people. And really, in the first three and a half years, some will be saved but they're getting what they want. The Jewish people are getting what they want. They're getting the temple rebuilt. They're getting peace, right? But once that rug is pulled out from under them and they go through unbelievable tribulation, they're setting themselves up for what is said in the Old Testament where Israel will be saved in a day. We'll talk more about that when we get there. But look what it says in verse number 16. Then let those who are in Judea, those Jewish people, let them flee to the mountain. Let him, him who is on his housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him, him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are impregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter on the Sabbath. He said it's going to be bad. You're going to be running for your life. You're going to be hiding. You're going to do every. It's going to be bad because you're going to be public enemy number one. Remember in the book of Revelation, I believe it's chapter 12, when, when Satan came to try to get the Christ. But he couldn't, so he turned against the, to going after the woman who brought the Christ, Israel. He's hated them ever since. Verse 21, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then... If anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. The false prophet's going to do some amazing things on the earth. Many people are going to praise him. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning, come on now, comes from the east... And flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. 
wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Verse 28 is talking about what happens after the Valley of Armageddon. Old Testament says all those people who will die in the Valley of Armageddon, the birds of the field, all those will come. It will be seven months of burying and eating and all the pestilence of all those who will die during that time. But he goes and he says there, as the sun, as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Let me give you a great prophetic word that most of you might have just not thought about and may have missed. Turn to Acts chapter 1. Did you know Acts chapter 1 is an absolutely wonderful chapter for prophecy? Now, as soon as I say this, you're going, well, preacher, I knew that. I know that. But I just got to remind you of it. Is that fair? Say, yes, it's fair, preacher. Makes me feel better if you say that. Acts chapter 1. There's something absolutely glorious that happens in Acts chapter 1. Our Lord raised his hands and the law of gravity was suspended and our Lord ascended back. And everybody that's standing there, <laughs> they're looking. I mean, that's a wow moment, right? Could you just imagine? You've never seen this. And you know the one that you love, he's told you over and over and over and over again what was about to happen. But yet they're there and they see it, and they see the Lord ascend up. Now look in verse number 11. Well, the last phrase in verse 10 said, so Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Now listen to this phrase. This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, what does it say? Will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. You literally saw him rise and go. His feet were on the earth, and you saw him ascend. Put it in reverse. He will come back in light manner, but this time he's going to come back and put his feet on the earth. The rapture, he's in the clouds. He calls us. He blows the trumpet. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then, you, then uh, those who are alive and and remain shall be caught up to the Lord in the, air, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall they ever be with the Lord. That's the rapture. We meet him in the air. But the second coming is when he comes back to set his feet on this earth. He promised. And here's the word to them. And their heart had to be breaking. Because the one that they loved, that they saw crucified, now they're celebrating because he's resurrected. Now he's ascending, and they think they're losing something again. But there was hope that was given to them. And the preaching of the, of the second coming should be one of the greatest sermons of hope because he promised he would come back. Amen? Now, for those of us that are here, that are living in this church age, we're going to be raptured out of this place. So when he comes back, we're going to be coming with him. With him. So I, we, I won't be on the earth during that time of the second coming. I'll be with him at the time of the second coming. On earth, it will be war like no war we've ever seen. We've had the war that ended all wars, World War I. The one thing we know is it didn't end wars, right? Then we have the Second World War. And this is going to be a world war. Two million coming from the east, two million soldiers from the east. The Euphrates River dried up where they could cross over. Everything comes to that one place once again. This one little spot on the earth, I'd love to see it one time before that time. I don't think I'm ever going to get a chance to go to Israel in that day. But this one little place on the earth is the center of all the attention. And that's where that battle will be. That's where, where Christ ascended, and that's where he will come back. I'm going to just pause there for a moment. You any questions?
Okay. Praise God. Take your Bibles, Revelation 19. I'm just getting warmed up. I could be here for a while. Revelation 19, are you there? Say amen. amen. Look in verse number 11. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, white, pure, holy, undefiled. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. <laughs> I love that. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. Is this not Jesus Christ? It has to be. The armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. He himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Verse 17, we see the battle that is Armageddon. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out, saying, with a loud voice, saying, to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast by the way, verse 17 and 18, that's the seven months we were talking about that it will take to clean up afterwards. It's going, to be, it's going to be gruesome. I saw the beast, the king of the earth, and their armies gather together to make war against him. They think they're going to fight against God. Satan knows better, or does he? His pride is probably telling him he can take him. I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and, his, uh, and against his army. Then the beast was captured, that is the Antichrist, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive. Anybody tells you that hell and the lake of fire it's just a place where you're annihilated and you, you go to soul death and you, you don't ever live, or live anymore? No. No. New Holland, listen to me. There are three things that live forever. The Lord God, his word, and the souls of men. Those things live forever. Our God, his word, and the souls of men. And this Antichrist, a human, and this false prophet, a human, they were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. The rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse that is from God himself, and the birds were filled with their flesh. Then he goes on in chapter 20 to say that Satan will be bound in the bottomless pit for a point in time. And um, then um, in verse 4, he, he says that there will be the resurrection. You see, during the tribulation, some will die who are believers. Some will die who are believers in the Antichrist or unbelievers. And some will be alive that are believers when he comes, and they'll be taken from the four corners of the earth so they can be with God, so they will not be part of this uh, battle. Some will, who have the mark of the beast, every one of those will die. But there are those that do not believe in Christ and have not believed in the Antichrist, and they will be allowed to live as well. So um, take your Bible 
and I want you to turn to Jeremiah. Chapter 23. Can I have five more minutes? If y'all have to go, I understand, but this is too good. Jeremiah 23. By the way, I could read testament, I could read scripture from the Old Testament talking about. When Christ comes back, that second coming, um, it's just filled of it. But this is just some that I picked. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Here he's talking about those false leaders that led Israel in the wrong direction. Therefore, thus say the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doing, says the Lord. Now listen in verse 3. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them, bring them back to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. He's talking about Israel here. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them. They shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. This is great. Verse 5. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. I will raise to David a branch of righteousness that could be no one other than the only one worthy Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord a king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth in his days Judah will be saved Israel will dwell safely now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness the Jehovah to send you Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that they shall no longer say, as the Lord who lives, who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. That's old news. But the good news is verse 8. But as the Lord lives, who brought up and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the north country and from all the countries where I have driven them, they shall dwell in their own land. He said, we're going to quit talking about leaving Egypt. Now we're going to talk about how God has brought them back where they can stay and be his forever. Look in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter number 2. I'm going to leave out a lot, but I want to give you a little bit. Are you there? Say amen. amen. Isaiah chapter number 2, verse 1. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house, that is the government, shall be established on the top of the mountains over all the other governments and shall be exalted above the hills, all the countries, and all nations shall flow to it, that is God's government. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We shall walk in his paths. That's an amazing statement. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Verse 4, he shall judge between the nations, that is Christ, and rebuke many people. He will tell them the truth. They shall beat their swords in the plowshares, their spears in the pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. We're not going to have to worry about no, no more wars and rumors of wars because God will reign in righteousness and no one will go against him. Look in chapter 11, Isaiah 11, verse number 1. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, once again, from the line of David. A branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, the awe of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. This is going to be living on this earth like we've never understood 
It will be done right because Christ says so. And with righteousness he, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. That's at the beginning of it. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins. Faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf shall, uh, shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. A little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Now, there's nothing new about a cow grazing, but a bear, and they will graze together. The young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. This is the way it was meant. This is the way it was in the Garden of Eden. Animal will not eat animal. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. How many of you would let your, child, your, let your newborn do that? Not today, but in that day, there will be no fear because God's power will reign. The weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, all of his government. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him. His resting place shall be glorious. I mean, I really could go on and read. I'm going to can I do, I'm going to do one last one. I promise you it'll be the last one. But really, you could go from uh, Isaiah chapter 60 all the way through 66, and all of them talk about the time of the millennial reign. But I want you to look with me uh, in chapter number 65. I'm going to cut it short. Let's look in verse number 18. Isaiah 65. Verse number 18, you there say amen. You're not there, say so wait just a second. All right, here we go. Verse number 18, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. And by the way, that's a good word for the day. What he gives us should be enough. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem. And joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old as a child. But the sinner, being 100 years old, shall be accursed. That will be those during the millennium who never believed in Christ, who never accepted in him as the Lord and Savior. They will live, but they will die a normal life, but not for those that are believers. Verse 21, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build uh, and another inhabit it. In other words, if you build, build it, you, you don't have to worry about someone else taking it. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree, so shall the days of my people, shall, so be, so shall be the days of my people. My elect, that is God's called out, shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble. For they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. Mm. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. I could go on. I've gone past my five minutes, I told you. I just want to tell you so very much. What Broadus said, he said very well, and that our, our mind cannot comprehend eternity. Our mind cannot comprehend good in the framework of God because we've never seen it. We've sniffed it, but we've never seen it. And during the time of the millennium, that's all that will be seen. The glory of God, we were talking, Lance and I were talking about how could there be a covering with the glory of God? How could you be in the presence of the glory of God? We will have a new body, and we will be fit for that. 
There will be people who are born during the millennium. And they will live a life. But we will already have our new body and we will not die. Now, a lot of times, and I'm going to say this and say amen. People are today talking about heaven. They quickly go to the new heaven and the new earth. And they, they talk about the, the no tears in heaven and all those things. And they think that they, 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 they bypass what Christ has put in place there. When we, when we, for the souls who die now, they go to be in the presence of the Lord. And they're, from, from Abel forward, they're all there, all the believers. At the rapture of the church, we're going to get our body. For those that, whose souls are already there, he'll give them their body. For those of us who are here, we'll be raptured up and we'll be changed and we'll have a new body. But we will go to be in the glory of heaven where the marriage supper of the Lamb will take place. But it's going to be until it's played out, that one last chance for Israel during the tribulation, then God will say enough. He will come back. There will be a war. He will speak the word. That'll be the, it'll be done. And he will usher in this time of millennial reign where we will be also. And we will work for the glory of God. For the glory of God. My heart will be unleashed. Those things that you have in your heart that we're living in part towards God, you'll get to live to the fullest unto him. And at the end of that thousand years, once again, Satan will be turned loose and it'll be ugly for a season. It just doesn't say a time frame. It just says for a season. Then God will put an end to that. Satan will be cast into the lake of fire. Then all the unbelievers from Cain forward will be resurrected. And then they will stand before what is known as the great white throne judgment. And the books will be opened, which is their works. And the book, singular, will be opened, which is the Lamb's book of life. And none of those people will be written in the Lamb's book of life because they're lost. And only the saved are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then they will, he will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. And they will be cast alive into the lake of fire. I really wanted to get to the end of that. And I apologize for going long. But let me just say, I'm preaching on the judgment of God Sunday morning. And I've been, uh, it's been weighing heavily on my heart. We're going to talk about Abraham, but we're also going to talk about the judgment of God that came against Sodom and Gomorrah. And it still bothers me that in my own soul, I'm not pointing a finger at anybody else, but in my own soul, I do not weigh the, the lake of fire when I think of people today who do not know Jesus Christ as, as their Lord and Savior. There should never be a day that goes by that I do not weigh the lake of fire that souls who live forever, who do not have a relationship with God, they will go to be there forever and ever and ever. And um, so I wanted to get to the end. So let me say amen. Lance, if you'll go turn off the stream, please, sir. I appreciate that. Let's pray. Father, I pray, Lord, that uh, you bless these people for listening so well tonight, intently to the end. And Lord, uh, there's so much more that you told us, but Lord, I think we get the gist. And Father, we don't need 20 more lessons on this until we start to get in our heart the seriousness of, of the truths that you're trying to share with us, that people are born and we live with a soul that will live forevermore and people will make a decision about where they're going to spend their eternity while they're still on this earth 
but it will not be lived here. It will be lived there. So Lord, help us to know the truth, believe the truth, and live accordingly. Forgive me for letting my love grow cold or my concern grow cold. Lord, uh, I know you are always caring for the lost because Jesus, even on the cross, you took time for salvation there with all that you were going through. So Lord, uh, help me to learn to deny myself and take up my cross daily and to be a full-fledged follower of Christ. Lord, give us souls. Give us fruit for our labor. Let us see the rejoicing and the faces of those who've trusted Jesus Christ afresh and new. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.